in Nortel Networks. Early in my professional career, that was a very esteemed company pushing the envelope with trying to develop the internet, infrastructure for the internet, as well as phones. Peak of the tech bubble in 2000, it was reported that they did 30 billion in revenue. They were worth $250 billion in the year 2000. Think about that, 250 billion. Early 2000s also, Dave, do you remember? That's when Blackberries started to take off. That big, clunky, heavy laptop that you had to lug around, you didn't have to take it everywhere. You game could changer. communicate with colleagues in and out. And that's where Blackberry came in, changed the game. You don't need that heavy laptop everywhere. And at the time, the all, how you communicate, email, phone, and text. That's it, all those three. Yeah. And that yep. phone did it well. <laughs> Listening to. Welcome to What the Tech, your gateway to business strategies and tech secrets shaping today's workplace. Rolando, I got a blast to the past for you. All right. Tell me if you remember this sound. <laughs> oh. oh. Yes, a classic, classic for anybody that's over the age of 30. You know, we were kind of joking about this earlier. When this sound came on, there was two things that could go wrong. One of the kids could jump on the telephone and ruin the connection. Ugh. Or one of our friends could call the house. Even yes. An incoming call would have disrupted dial-up right. internet service at that time because it wasn't guaranteed when you hear that connection that right. there sounds that you were actually going to get through right sometimes yep. it would keep repeating itself i know and it would repeat again and it would repeat again and again and again until eventually you got a connection into the quote www <laughs> internet if right? you were lucky enough you know i remember sometimes you'd go to log on i forget what the visual was but you were waiting you were like please connect Please connect, please connect. And if you were on like right after dinner, when there was a lot of people trying to use it, you wouldn't be able to log on. It just wouldn't happen just because people in the neighborhood were all logging yeah. on. Yeah. Yes. It would be so frustrating because there was no guarantees you get. We take it for granted now, right? Oh, I mean, for the sure. thing that keeps you off the internet now is, you know, the power goes out or the service provider has something that, you know, the servers go down and outage right? And you can't log on and, or, you know, some, it doesn't happen as often uh, on your cell phone. You know, your service is down for whatever reason, something, some bug or something at AWS goes down, but we take it for granted, Dave, that you could pretty much be anywhere and be guaranteed to get on line on the www on the internet or interwebs it's a whole different world back then and w i think that's w what we want to talk w about today the world we're in today right and kind of peel back the onion a little bit on how did we get here you know there's a lot of events that led up to we didn't just parachute in and all of a sudden you know we have chat gpt and all the rest but certain events set themselves up one by one and we want to Talk a little bit about that. Yeah. The, the evolution was quick. You know, the evolution was so quick. You know, think about 1980s to 1990s, even into early 2000s. There were some brands that were running the world back then. They were running the communication landscape. And some of these brands are no longer here. You know, one of them that we were chatting about earlier was, you know, IBM. IBM mm. was massive. You know, what do you remember yeah. about IBM? IBM was the shiz, right? They were the gorilla in every office. They had the mainframes. They had the name. They basically pioneered the personal computer. Everything was an IBM. I don't know if you remember this, Dave, but back then you had an IBM or you had a clone. And that's when PCs started coming out. And those PCs eventually Eventually, the, the whole clone thing was dropped, but I just, as we were putting this together, I was like, yeah, wasn't, weren't anything other than an IBM was called a clone. And IBM dominated that space. You know, today, IBM doesn't make any more laptops or personal computers. Lenovo bought that business from them. Right. But no, that's right. who would have known that IBM, basically the inventors of the mainframe and the personal computer, would not be making computers today? At least what well, they used to be. Maybe. Yeah. And that, and that's just on the computer side, you know, so we're, we're in the voice communications world and, you know, there used to be a hundred different brands of telephones. Oh yeah. 
There were a lot more, a yeah. lot, a lot of, a lot of phones. You know, one of the big players in that space was Bell Labs, yep. and they're the ones that innovated that the phones and and, and all of those uh, telecom inventions, and that spawned or spun out Lucent Technologies. Mm-hmm. Maury, do we have anything on Lucent Technology? There we go. Ideas, ideas, also known as innovations. Uh, inventions and breakthroughs from Bell Labs. Get um while they're hot. Lucent Technologies. We make the things that make communications work. Ah, crazy. That, wow. I'll tell you, their, their trademarked logo is uh, burned into my brain. I, it's funny, it's just a red circle of sorts. Uh, it's I a think red, there's some history behind that. Painted but... circle, yeah. Yeah, but that that was like ingenious branding, something so simple, something so simple, but resonated, you know, so well. It did. And, you know, who would have thought? So Bell Labs, IBM, innovation. Innovation was expensive. It's always been expensive uh, for the most part. You're, you're building devices. You need engineers. You need research. You need, you know, to push the envelope. And things were centralized in these big behemoth companies like Bell Labs, like IBM, who were known for innovating new things, new toys, new gadgets, new, new, new parts of the infrastructure and components. But things were going to change. Inevitably, things were going to change. But I don't think anybody had an idea of how much we would change as we were inching from those 80s, those 90s from Lucent. And then the mid-90s, another company that, that really spawned a ton of innovation, Nortel Networks. Yep. I remember, Dave, early in my professional career, next to Lucent, Nortel was probably, and IBM, that was a very esteemed company pushing the envelope with, with the with trying to develop the internet, infrastructure for the internet, as well as phones. They really right. changed the game and put a lot of pressure on Lucent when it came to phones and phone innovations and phone systems. Big time. And they had a ton of phones. You know, I remember having physical compatibility guides back in early 2000, 2001. So we're selling devices and people would say, I have a Nortel telephone. They'd give you the model number. You'd flip to this particular page within a compatibility guide to find what devices were compatible. And there were like two or three pages of Nortel phones. They, I don't know how many years they've been, they were in business. We did a little bit of research in the peak of the tech bubble in 2000. It was reported that they did 30 billion in revenue. 30 billion in revenue blows my mind when I think about what they were making. I don't know if there's 30 billion telephones, you know, in existence any longer. Not oh, like that no, anyway, no, not no, desk phones. Sure. No, and I'm looking at the notes that you put in there, Dave. They were worth $250 billion in the <sighs> year 2000, which ushered in the next era that we're going to talk about in a moment. But think about that, $250 billion. That's what they were worth, a giant, yeah. enormous. Can we catch a glimpse of, of if, you're, if you're watching us in the, on the video set, can Here we put a little sound on that? Or top. Come grooving up Grainy video. <laughs> Low res. Look at that. High speed internet access. Totally different. Internet cable access. He got hair down. Public internet. I remember that in the, at the airports. Intranet. Inside the country. Multimedia conference. He got toe jam football. Hotel internet. Wireless internet for the phone, for cell mobile phones. I know you. You know me. One thing I can tell you. Bringing it all together with the true power of the internet. Come together. Nortel Networks. Right now. How the world shares ideas. How so much has changed. You know, I remember working for one of the manufacturers that supplied, that made actually products for them. And they were an account where we wanted to be in in terms of selling, selling with their reps so they could push our products alongside their products. And nobody knew what was about to come. And the hammer was going to come down on Nortel. The hammer was going to come down on Lucent. Both of them, you know, Lucent peaked according to the different sources. They peaked around 99. And, hmm. you know, they also were mammoth. They had around $40 billion in revenue in 99, very close to Nortel's $30 billion when they peaked in 2000 and the hammer did come down, the party ended, the, the 
bubble bursted on the dot com in the early 2000s. And nobody would have, we weren't expecting that. I remember I was in Florida at the time and I was talking to a client and he said to me, have you heard the news? And I'm like, what? Well, Nortel is closing their Latin America offices, which in South Florida. And I knew a lot of people there. And that was like the beginning of the end for Nortel when I heard that. And you know, now we know that that's the case. But one of the things that, w that I want to drive about that is that innovation is something you can't bottle into a box and control yourself. Back then, proprietary was the way big, big innovation was driven by these big telecom companies, and it was all centralized. And the internet now allowed people and business to be connected from very, very, very far places. And now all of a sudden, ideas could flow from multiple angles, multiple parts of the world, regions that were never connected. Right. And now ideas could be decentralized. You could share some ideas. I mean, it, it was not Zoom back then, but nope. it, it allowed some of this stuff to start. It allowed the spark. You know, it allowed companies like AOL to come in. You know, uh, also along that, that, that time frame, I don't know if you remember Ericsson, uh, which later became Sony Ericsson, but Ericsson also helped with some of those innovations in driving some of the infrastructure behind the cell phones uh, and also behind the infrastructure for a lot of those cell phone companies that then also allowed, I would say, the next wave of innovation to come in, right? If we were to, to summarize a little bit of that first wave, it would be the, the was, what are we calling that, Dave? Was it the dawn? The, the, da the dawn of the internet age. The you know, dawn of the internet beginning. age. That's a very appropriate uh, kind of all encapsulating for that first period, 80s through 2000s. And now the next age or the next story of that, I would say is the WWW, the World Wide Web. I mean, who <laughs> uses the World Wide Web anymore? I mean, the youngsters probably don't even know that that existed, that that was a thing. <laughs> you would refer to a website when you would say a website, you would say, like if it were Amazon, it's www.amazon.com, <laughs> right? Yeah, just hearing you say that is so funny. My mother, um, my mother was a couple of years ago. I was telling her about some things that we were doing on on the Global Tech website, and she said, "Oh, I'd love to see it." I said, "Oh, you should go online check it out." She's like, "Where can I see it?" I said, "It's a uh, global dash tech t e c k dot com," and she said, "Do I need to?" Do I need to also type www in front of it? I'm like, yeah, you can, you should, but you don't have to. She's like, well, things have definitely changed. I don't have to do that anymore. She thought that was a huge time saver, Rolando. I know. My 72 year old mother no longer has to type www. That is like automation to her. Right. It gets, it got shorter. You didn't have to type in. And even, even I believe back then you did have to type in the whole thing. Now you could just type in the domain name of the company right. so that you can get right into it. And that whole HTTPW slash, duh, duh, nobody talks about that anymore. That's over with, <laughs> right? But this internet thing, <clears throat> the WWW, uh, oh, so isn't that like Worldwide Wrestling Federation too? Wasn't that um, back I think it was then? W, I think you're trying to say WWF, but th that was WWE the World and... Wildlife Foundation oh, and yeah, also yeah, yeah. World Wrestling World Federation. Wrestling. Yeah. Uh, different type of nerd over here. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> but you know, that internet age and combined with the bubble bursting on the dot com, things started changing, right? Information was starting to decentralize. It certainly didn't mean the end of IBM, but it started changing things. And we had a new emergence of new players because PCs in the late nineties started to get cheaper. You had this new thing called the internet. And so now instead of simply taking your P or laptops that started coming online, you could now leave the office with a big clunky, heavy laptop, <laughs> right? So that was an innovation. And then take that in. A, if your company was ahead of the curve, you'd have some kind of internet. I remember 
uh, at the time I was working for Philip Morris, now known as Altria, we had all of, all of the sales reps pretty much had uh, some type of internet connectivity that was, was, was provided by or paid by, by them. And we used ISDN, which was an upgrade from regular dial-up. So you can send information faster because, you know, we had to, you know, plug in and the reports would get uploaded to the mainframes and all that business. And it would take time. So ISDN was the way to go. But the internet allowed this information, to, to, the information we would collect from the field to be uploaded and back to the offices in New York where managers would, uh, you know, analyze and do what they need to do with that information. Right. But, but my point is that you didn't have to be in the office sitting at the company desk, at the company computer with the company desk phone to do the work anymore. You could send and that was back in 1997 when i was doing that laptop in tow head out to the customer sites uh go see customer accounts and gather the information and upload it at the end of the night or at the end of the day uh back to uh the office and off we were uh and you know this allowed some other companies to take off but we're going back to the internet piece dell you know they they were when i went to college Every computer was a Dell. You know? Sure. Uh, AOL, which became, you know, the largest merger in history. They're actually, their, their offices, their headquarters is not about 10 minutes from where I live over in Dulles. And now those offices are data center offices. So they had a whole huge complex. And now that complex is pretty much data centers. And, and I, I believe there's a, one of the big military contractors is over there. So AOL has got a teeny, teeny little. A footprint in there that that still remain dave you remember compact oh my goodness do i ever yeah so i come from my 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 stepmother was in the tech field her entire career so she actually came up with like i think she started with honeywell but it moved into digital and a compact purchased digital and then i think hp eventually purchased compact Yes, no, in 2002, so many brands. I, I actually have the notes here on that. In 2002, Hewlett Packard, now known as HP, completed the acquisition of Compaq for approximately $25 billion. And the merger was a significant event in the tech industry, creating a technology company second in revenue to IBM. Now, this mm. was 2002. So the, 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 uh, the tech companies of the day, Compaq, IBM, and Microsoft was emerging as well. But, but think about that. Compaq and HP, because things were about printing, right? Where could you print? Where could you work? Or, or devices that allow this. You had your laptops, and HP was known for printing. And most of the printing happened at the office. Again, that changed when smaller printers came online, and you could print stuff at home, right? So that enabled that home office is the early home office with your laptop, your printer, your, and your other devices to, to, to proliferate. Now, early 2000s also, Dave, do you remember how that's when Blackberries started to take off? Yeah, for sure. That then allowed that big clunky, heavy laptop that you had to lug around. You didn't have to take it everywhere. You Game could changer. communicate with colleagues in and out. And some companies did allow communications externally so that you could communicate outside the company. And that's where BlackBerry came in, changed the game. You don't need that heavy laptop everywhere. And at the time, the, all, how you communicate? Email, phone, and text. That's it, all those three. Yeah. And that yep. phone did it well and sounded good. And we had a guest on um, who was a former president of BlackBerry, Mr. Sandeep. If you want to hear that story, go check out that episode with Sandeep. He unloads about a bunch of stuff, BlackBerry and other things. But Dave, BlackBerry changed the game. I love my BlackBerry. So I, I, the first time I saw a BlackBerry, 2000, I think it's 2004, 2005. I'm at a trade show down in Atlanta. We have a short break. And I need to take my laptop and just quickly check, uh, just quickly check emails. So I find a little corner, I open it up, 
I dial in through the VPN. I finally get logged in. I do all this work just so I can look at a couple of emails. It took me the entire lunch break. I never grabbed lunch, but I was able to look at a couple of emails. Um, but as I was doing that, there was someone kind of sitting not too far from me. He takes, a, he takes out this thing out of his pocket, hadn't really seen it before. And he's just, just kind of doing this. And then he grabs lunch. And now when we're back in the trade show, he says, um, he says, hey, you know, you got to look, your company should invest in these. I'm like, well, yeah, what is that? And he's telling me all about it and how much faster it is than the laptop. He's like, I was able to get all my voice, uh, sorry, all my emails done in five, 10 minutes. And I was back having lunch. And I couldn't believe how much time I could have saved if I had something like that. Again, I'm doing email on this massive Dell laptop. Like I said, the VPN, I'm dialing in and, you know, to watch somebody else have this tool that wasn't part of my organization's kind of tech stack, if you will, it was like a game changer for them. It definitely, you know, if you have, technology is going to leave you behind, right? Uh, there's always going to be changes. And if, if you're able to be faster than your competitor, then you have an advantage. And this guy definitely had an advantage. I like that. Um, I, I don't know if it's Mark Zuckerberg that made that phrase, you know, um, break, th uh, run fast and break things. You know, it has its advantage, especially in tech, uh, being first movers and, and first adopters, because technology is a race. It is a race. Um, and when you're talking, you know, these larger companies, when you're talking about investments and R&D and roadmap, a, a lot of them spend a lot of money now uh, innovating in a different way. Um, just like what we're talking about, the innovation was, you know, in the big, uh, telecom companies of the day, Nortel and Lucent, whatever, uh, the innovation, because it was moving around, it wasn't centralized all in one place. It was, it was starting to emerge. It was starting to shift. And, you know, we were talking about Blackberry. You all wanted to just say this, that the, that Blackberry stock peaked at an all-time high of $147 in mid-2008. Wow. You know why? Well, I'm going to tell you why. It was because Black, uh, BlackBerry had a competitor, a serious competitor, that they underestimated in 2007 called Apple. Apple decided to change the game. Steve Jobs, more importantly, came out with the iPhone in 2007. So what that means is that it didn't take long for Wall Street to say, you know what? Hold up a second BlackBerry and look at here. Yes, things changed. Phones have changed. You know, we uh, the, the way we communicate has changed from the phone and I remember those cordless. So if you're watching this on on the video, you get to see this little montage that we put together and I'll buy Steve Jobs or buy Apple. And June of 2007, he releases, or Apple releases, the iPhone. And I remember, Dave, when it was released, a lot of businesses and a lot of the headlines, and I think, you know, some, some, you, if you're a competitor, you run interference, right? You run the FUD, you know, because you want to take the steam out of, out of the headline. And you say, well, that's never going to work. Or businesses will never adopt it because, by the way, in 2008, um, when you look at the number, it, BlackBerry had a millions of subscribers. I want to say it was in 2011. In 2011, they had 85 million subscribers worldwide. Oof. So although the stock peaked in 2008, Wall Street was saying, hey guys, we got to pump the brakes here because there's some innovation coming and maybe you're a little overvalued. Let's take some money off the table and put, a little, put our bets somewhere else. Otherwise, they would have kept um, you know, that stock price, because the stock market's a little bit forward looking mm -hmm. versus actual sales that happen today. So even though they, they, they peaked out at 85 million subscribers, Steve Jobs, uh, if you can recall, Dave, when the iPhone came out, BlackBerry was the de facto device for every enterprise. It was the way to communicate. It was the way to do business. It was what was on everybody's hip. And because of the iPhone, we got the terminology BYOD, bring your own device. Right. And that was enabled by a technology 
called, uh, I want to say, uh, 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 mobile device managers. So this was, these were third-party software that came online so that you can manage mobile device, like an iPhone, maintain security, have the security policies you need, because that used to reside in BlackBerry in what they called the BES server, B-E-S, hmm. BlackBerry Enterprise Server. And it had all the controls and all the security an IT manager would need. But now these MDMs, these mobile device managers, could do the same thing. That was, I would say in my book, the beginning of the end for BlackBerry because right. when they caught on to doing apps, it's just started, the train had already started leaving and they could not catch up to, to uh, did, um, Steve Jobs. Did iPhones, did iPhones always have kind of a touch screen to it or did they ha ever have tactical kind of feel keyboard like BlackBerry? Um, no, no keyboard. Completely Never a keyboard. Display. It was always touch screen. 100% display. Yeah, but, I mean, two devices completely different trying to solve the same task, at least the same task at the time. Do you remember what Sandeep told us? He told us a story that Ericsson, six years before the iPhone, they had a very similar technology ready to go, and Ericsson, Sony Ericsson, canned it because of, for business reasons. Mm. But they had a touch screen that was a huge improvement over what was available at the time. At the time, you needed a stylus, and you really had to press down on the screen yep. to make that screen work with the stylus. Well, the innovation that he had mentioned to us was a, a leap forward, was what we now know more of a display, kind of a, you know, it just kind of mirrors and follows your, your touch and, and whatnot. But they canned it. They poo-pooed that project. But that's so interesting and fascinating that the technology existed. Apple changed the game. It became now smartphones and apps. That world started to take over in the mid-2000s. Um, yeah, mid-2000s, 2011, 2012, 2015. And then chugging along the way, chugging, just kind of innovating there were some three big companies that would change what we know today, um, the IT world, was Microsoft, Google, and Amazon. And all three were working at different angles, but they would come up in a way that would be very different than IBM, very different than Nortel. And they all today are aiming for the gold standard of companies. And I would say, I would propose that Apple is the gold standard today when it comes to companies for this reason. And, yeah. and also echoed by my, one of our guests, back to Sandeep from a uh, former president of BlackBerry, is the stickiness factor. You can't be sticky today if you only have a device today. That's if you right. only sell, no matter what device it is, it's very difficult by itself a fitbit by itself is difficult for it to be sticky and a lot of those companies that tried to um, create fitbits they've gone under uh mobile companies cell phone companies by themselves it's difficult it's multiple uh htc and palm along with blackberry a lot of them don't exist and blackberry still exists but as a totally different company Hardware alone, Nortel was the same story. IBM gave up on their uh, laptop business. Motorola sold also their s a smartphone business over to a Chinese company. Lenovo took over the IBM PCs. It is extremely difficult. Yeah, yeah, we can name several more hardware companies, but Apple changed the game. They decided to come out with the iPhone. They decided to come out with apps. They would charge a fee or a revenue commission, depending on how you look at it. Or they would take a cut of all revenue generated with their apps. They would also go on to put in streaming services. So they brought in services, devices, and created an ecosystem that is very sticky. They they've now have Apple Pay. So now it's a complete ecosystem that you never have to leave if you're an Apple customer. Man, and I think, what, what a strategy, huh? Yeah. What a strategy. It's like, this is what we're going to do. It's 
the device will create an experience, but the you know the back end programming, the software, the way that it operates is really what's going to. It's almost, it was almost sinister. It's like we're going to keep them addicted to our product. <laughs> We're going to come out with a new $1,200 phone every 18 months. They're going to be forced to buy it. And our competitor isn't going to be able to come in and grab them because they don't operate within the same platform. It's I've only had Apple products. So is my son, but my wife is Android. Mm -hmm. There's nothing we can do to convince her to come over to the side of things, <laughs> you know? And she's the same way. She's like, no, I, I like Android, and these are the reasons. And, you know, maybe we get you guys Android phones. And my son and I look at each other, we're like, no way, man. We have too much invested in this. I don't want to start over. And it, it feels like it would be starting over. But they, I mean, fantastic business strategy. Get them addicted. Keep giving them new products, things that are innovative, things that are exciting. And we'll have customers for life. And I think that's why... You know, the forward thinkers in the stock market back in 2007, I know a lot of people that were buying Apple stock back then. They were telling me that I should, and I really wish I was paying attention because <laughs> uh, some of these folks are retiring early now that I know, and it's all because of Apple stock. Well, also in 2007, I'm glad you brought that part up. But if we go back a little bit, Google, that's when they released Android. So Steve Jobs released iPhone. And shortly after that, Google comes out and releases Android. They don't want to be left out of the, the smartphone game. All right. Um, but prior to that, you know, Google also uh, launched in 2000 Google Ads, diversifying their search business. Mm. Uh, they acquired YouTube, which is the second or third largest search engine in the world. Um, and obviously 2007, they launched Android. But like you said, they created a, a sticky platform like your wife um, does that doesn't want to leave Android. You know, the, the Google ecosystem between the work, the Google workspace stuff, the Android, YouTube, if you have a Google phone, it all works together, right? Mm -hmm. it, it all it easily seamless. You know, you can move from one side of the platform to another, whether it's downloading videos, watching it, email, all the different productivity apps that come with Google and the whole ecosystem, right? So now we've got Apple being gold standard. I would say, you know, Google is right in that mix, right? Right in the mix. You know, Apple has a little bit higher valuation. They have some things that, that, that Google doesn't have. Google has a smartphone side now with Google Pixel. Uh, and, and, you know, Apple has a more robust product lineup when it comes to the actual devices themselves. Google responds back and they go and acquire Nest, which is a phenomenal product uh, in the home. So Google made some serious advances, but here comes, um, you know, players like Amazon who started with the books. Uh, yeah. They launched Prime. They decide, I don't know if they're taking a playbook from one of the different companies exactly how, but, you know, Bezos moved away from just having Books sold on their website. They opened up a marketplace. In 94, Bezos founded Amazon and sold those books online. What a crazy idea. Nobody Selling books really online. knew. <laughs> so heavy. Online. Let's sell one of the heaviest consumer goods there are through the mail. Right. And through the mail. Who knew, <laughs> right? Who knew? And, in two, and that also would have been a great stock to buy early as well. In, yep. in 2000, he launched the marketplace. In 2000, he launched the marketplace, and in 2005, launched Prime, which would forever change what we think about an ecosystem as well. And in 2015, Amazon surpasses Walmart as the most valuable retailer in the world. They went on to buy Whole Foods in 2016. So if you're a Whole Foods customer, now you're part of the Prime experience as well. And in 2017, AWS, which is their cloud division, would become the dominant player when it comes to cloud services. So now they've got this whole ecosystem and then you throw Alexa into the mix as well as some other acquisitions with healthcare and entertainment with Prime Video. You've got a well-oiled machine when you come 
to when it comes to ecosystem. So today we've got Amazon ecosystem slash platform. You've got Google ecosystem slash platform. You've got Apple again, ecosystem slash platform. All of them have very sticky. And I guess you'd have to throw Microsoft into that hat too. They're not as consumery, right? In the enterprise space, they are a beast. Oh, you gosh. can't, you can't remove, why well, I can say can't, but who's going to remove Microsoft from the enterprise space, right? It is nearly impossible. They're so sticky with all of their products in the enterprise space that they are the gorilla when it comes to enterprise. Uh, they are the IT. gorilla, but you know what? Just like Amazon being David and Walmart being Goliath at one point, Amazon became the new Goliath. So if, mm. if Microsoft is the Goliath, you know, the, the crazy thing, when you, are the, when you are the reigning champ, you have a lot of targets on you, right? Mm. So everyone's chasing that gold standard of sorts. They, they see someone successful. They have the market share. And if you're competing against that, at least you know who your competition is. But yeah, I mean, Microsoft is massive. We were kind of taking a, a trip back down memory lane earlier when we were talking about Microsoft. We were talking about Skype. Oh, um, yeah. And how Skype, that. you know, Skype, I think, I believe Skype was just like a consumer free telephone thing that people were right. trying for a well, while. Well, let me take right? you further back. What about the net to phone? I remember, again, the <laughs> late 90s, yep. net to phone. So that, because look, today we take it for granted. We have mobile devices that essentially you could put it to your ear and talk for 10 hours if you wanted to. And yeah. it doesn't cost you a dime to call from, you know, DC to California. Back yep. then, th you paid by the minute, right? You did. And it cost I, a pretty penny to call somebody in California from uh, New York or even in the same state. Sometimes local calls are more expensive. Depending on the time of day you called. De Shit, I remember calling home from college. And if I called after 7 o'clock, then my calls were only 5 cents a minute or something like that. You know, you had like... You had peak hours and you had other hours of weekend. You know, weekends were a little less expensive than a yes, Tuesday yes. or a Wednesday. Yes. Long distance phone bills. I mean, I remember when I was living at home um, before I moved out in my very early 20s, I just graduated from college and my parents were like, you know what? You're responsible for your own phone bill. Kids, by the way, 30 year olds that are still on your parents' cell phone plans, you guys got it made. You got it Whoa. made. But my mother would sit me down. She'd have the AT&T phone bill. She'd slap it down on the table. She'd look at it. And I was living in Connecticut, and I had friends in Massachusetts. And my, mom, my, my stepmother would circle. Be like, all right, that's uh -oh. a 860 area code. There's a 617 <laughs> area code. She'd add it all up. And I was paying, I don't know, 20, 30, 40 bucks a month to call my friends like yeah we paid for long distance charges so when you mentioned net to phone and there was that other one that magic jack magic jack they had product. a little usb stick you would plug yeah. into your computer I, I swear it sounded almost too good to be true like i can make telephone calls to my computer if you had a computer because that was a long time ago but um you know, in an age where people were spending so much money, this was like necessary innovation. And, you know, those products, net to phone, what do we call it? Wall Jack? Um, Magic Jack. Magic Jack. I mean, that's the beginning of, you know, voice over IP, you know, telephony yep. over internet yep. protocol, you know, huge. And Super especially for international calls, because I was remember traveling and the roaming charges on cell phones back in the day was <laughs> astronomical so for the traveling salesperson international dialing you could do that on net to phone or or magic jack or you know you would be saving tons of money the more obviously the more you call the more you save and if the more people you had the more you save right and so th these were necessary uh competitors in a in a space where the per minute charges added up to a lot hey i can you know i can reduce that for you by half and sometimes even by 80%.
by using some of these internet providers. <clears throat> and so it was, it was, so I was looking that up while you were talking, the acquisition of Skype was in 2011 when Microsoft acquired yeah. I mean, 2011. So that's so uh, 13 years more or less from, from, from today. Yep. And, um, who would have thought that that would lead to what we know now today as Microsoft Teams? Right. Can you that, th can you can you say can you think of three other names that Teams had prior to <laughs> Teams? Link, OCS. I mean, it was it, Microsoft was already Skype tinkering with is. Voice over IP. Right. Uh, but Skype gave them a consumer product that was fully born and ready to use versus a product that they'd been. You know, they're not a telephone company. They weren't Nortel. They're not a net to phone. They're not any of those companies. They are a software company that basically put an operating system into a PC. That's where their, their bones, their origin story came right, from. Right. They evolved to bring some of these other things in house, but that's not what their expertise is. And they just went out and bought Skype. And today teams is now the new, what do you call that? The Phoenix that's emerged out of Skype. Right. And so that's what we're, we're left with today. You know, Dave, the world is changing. And we don't live in the same world as 2011, 2015. And these players, Apple, Microsoft, Amazon, Google, now are all having to look over their shoulder to some extent because of what's happening in the AI world. Now, AI has been around for years, but it wasn't unleashed like it has been in the last year or so with open AI. And what's happening right now, as we film this podcast, we don't know what's going to happen with open AI. Right. Chat GPT may be gone by next week because apparently the CEO has left. He's over at Microsoft. They gave him the title of CEO to run an advanced laboratory division, advanced research. And from what public reports say, a carte blanche to hire as many employees from open AI and bring them over to this new division at Microsoft, which is crazy. So essentially they can get the entire thing without ever having to buy. I mean, they invested in open AI, but essentially all of that know-how brought over it. Have you heard? I've never heard of something like that before. Like we're in a new age where a company all of a sudden says, okay, all those employees now become our employees <laughs> and there's no merger or acquisition that ever happened. Hey, what about the 80 people that didn't? Yeah, I forgot what the headlines were yesterday. Um, how, do, you, do you recall how many total employees were at? I think it was 770, and 700 of the 770 signed on to the letter that basically supports <laughs> Sam Altman. So what about those other people? I don't know. <laughs> they're, they're, either they think that being loyal to the board or whoever's left is the way to go, versus Sam. I mean, we don't a hundred percent know all of what led up to this. There's reports about this and that and the other. Some guy feel felt, you know, that the company was going in the wrong direction. Someone was passed over. I mean, there's a lot of information flying, mm. but we do know what we can see, which is there's a possibility open AI may just fold. I mean, the way it's going, I, mean, I don't think it'll, I mean, the, the, if it comes down to it, Microsoft will just acquire the rest and take the IP with them. And, you know, it'll be completely part of Microsoft or they could sell it off and, and who knows what's going to happen. But the cat is out of the bag when it comes to working in today's age. You know, if we're looking forward now from the 2020s and beyond, right around when COVID, you got open AI that came on just recently, you have these ecosystems and then you have what I think to be the most one of the most interesting pieces when it comes to business today, which is how the world of e-commerce, entertainment, and the platforms are changing. So if you look at what's happening right now with TikTok, you look at what's happening with Meta, uh, you find that the convergence of e-commerce and social media are, are going in a new direction. You know, TikTok is, who would have thought? that TikTok would try to take on Amazon, but they, that's what they're doing. They've got TikTok shop. Uh, they've got fulfillment centers. You know, 
us, you know, being in the e-commerce space ourselves, you know, we're, we're dabbling in that, uh, but they are a, a serious contender. And the experience, if we were to go back, let's say to what Steve Jobs did with the iPhone, he said the ex user experience is what matters. And Amazon did a fabulous job of that using a PC. TikTok is changing the way you experience online shopping via video first instead of a product page first. I don't know which is going to win, Dave, but I do know this, that they are changing the experience, which is what Steve Jobs did back in 2007. Yeah. And he said apps are the way to go. You have an app that's become super powerful, super influential, and they're saying, we're going to change the way people experience shopping. You know, I mean, if you think about it, when you're on Amazon, you know, Amazon just over the past couple of years, they're encouraging sellers to include more video, more demonstrations. Mm -hmm. When I'm on an Amazon listing and I'm kind of looking just even just through some of our stuff that we have up there, I'm looking at product reviews by content creators I'd never seen before, you know, so they, they are certainly incorporating video as part of this. But when you... I've only I've only played with TikTok shop a, a little bit, but I think that is pretty interesting. As you're kind of swiping through, suddenly you see a product doing something really cool, solving a problem that you need solving, and then right from there, push, click, add it to cart. You didn't seek out the demo. It seeked you. And by the algorithm, it might have known that I needed a way to log wood around in the winter time or whatever it might have been. So it's almost like an algorithm is getting to know you so that it can really serve up the product demonstration and get you to buy right away. It's really pulling on your heartstrings if it can solve a problem so quickly. It's like, I need that. And, you know, I think we're missing that for a little while in commerce in general. The I need this. And um, I... Yes. My question is, when does, when does TikTok start to charge a membership fee like Amazon Prime? Everyone I know, everyone I know subscribes to Amazon Prime. And all of those people were probably extremely reluctant at the very beginning. I have to pay to shop. I have to pay to spend money on Amazon. Why would I do that? Well, Bezos figured that out. Yeah. Well, he, he made it sticky. Back to our our guest Sandeep, he made it very sticky. He gave a value proposition that was, was probably one of the most genius ways to, to basically get customers on the platform, get them to, cause you know, I, I, I read somewhere and I wish I could remember what study. There's a huge difference between you giving something to somebody and you give it away for free. And then that person that same item, whether they pay a dollar or they pay a hundred dollars for it, the moment that person pays a dollar or a hundred, there is an investment on their part that says, I'm part of this in a way that I, it wasn't when I, it was free or given to me. So now, even though the investment of prime, which, you know, in the grand scheme of things, it, it does bring them money but it creates that investment in the person. Like I am part of this and I'm committed to this and I'm kind of married to this system right now in a way that's different than, you know, the app store for, mm. uh, for the iPhone. And so how does TikTok do it? They've got to come up with a way to give the consumer something that they would not have had prior to, let's call it TikTok prime or whatever it's going to be called. Right. They've mm -hmm. got to roll out more. They've, they've got a handful of, of fulfillment centers, whether it's, you know, hey, we're going to ship this to you tomorrow and it's going to, you know, you pay 25 bucks a year, just like what Amazon, Walmart has tried to do that. And it hasn't worked out in the same way as it has for Amazon because Prime membership, you, you, get, you get the Prime video, you get, you know, uh, some, some deals at Whole Foods when you're shopping at Whole Foods, as long as you're a Prime member, right? And on and on and on and on and on. TikTok doesn't have that value proposition for a paid subscription model unless they're going to give you something. Let's just say, well, we're going to let, we're going to stream, I don't know, music 
from artists and we're going to release it here first because you no know, TikTok now their music and their trending sounds are a way for artists to release music. That's changing the way the music industry looks at releasing uh, music because now the audience is being exposed to your sound, your music on somebody else's videos. And that could be millions and billions of views when you're talking about that. So are things changing? You bet. How are they going to shake out? I don't know, but I know that if history serves as a lesson, the user experience is vital. And if you can get that down you can create an ecosystem around that experience and wherever you go, it all comes back to being on the platform or part of the ecosystem. You've created the stickiness that our guest, former president of BlackBerry used to say that stickiness factor. And I, I wouldn't bet on tick. I wouldn't bet against TikTok right now. They, they have a lot of mojo, although they have a lot of headwinds with, you know, people complaining and Congress coming. Now, at the end, you know what? They, I think all this thing is going to get sorted out. There is no social media company yet that has been blackballed out of the U.S. There's just too much money involved. There's too many employees involved for TikTok. Uh, there's a lot of competitive interest between Meta and and TikTok. Um, and I think you know articles have already come out and said that that Facebook has been behind some of the dirty tactics. I didn't say that. You can look it up on the web and you'll find some of those articles <laughs> yourself, right? Hey, when, uh, when we talk about Facebook and Meta, now I knew that they were playing around for a little while with a subscription service. Did they ever launch that? I, I don't use Facebook. I'm not aware. I, I, you know, I'm going to plead the fifth on this, Dave. I don't, I'm not aware. I'm not as, mm. I don't want to say I, I know when I don't. And I, in this case, I'm not aware of exactly their intentions, but I know that for Meta, they're bet big, billions, big billions on the Metaverse. The jury's still out on that. I've seen some new improvements. There was a, uh, an interview with Lex Friedman and, and Mark Zuckerberg on the Metaverse, and it did look fascinating. It did look like an amazing new video experience. That's how I would, I would say. But that video experience is, still requires the big, huge goggles. Again, can Meta nail the user experience when it comes to the Metaverse? If they can, and they can execute on that, they may have something there. Is the timing right for it? I think so. For this reason, Dave, the remote work revolution is changing the face of work. It is changing the face of the future of work. Yep. I don't think anybody today can argue against what the pandemic has done for remote work. And every study that's been coming out, and I'm going to give big props to a future guest that's coming to come on. So if you're watching this now, you may want to check out that interview with Nick Bloom that we have. Uh, I think you're going to be fascinated by what you learn there with Nick Bloom, who has been studying remote work for, the, for, for decades now. And I don't think we're going back, Dave. So the convergence of things like remote work, We've got AI and we've got new players coming onto the scene when it comes to commerce, as well as communications, mm -hmm. like companies like Zoom that became extremely popular over the pandemic era. I think we are moving into that whole new shift. Like we saw, we talked about the eighties, the two thousands, now the twenties, I'll call them the twenties moving forward. I think the combination of AI, remote work, uh, decentralization of, of technology is going to change how we view the business world and who, who's going to come out on top. Right. Right. Well, I can certainly see that some of these platforms, they can create stickiness by bringing value of integrating within a current customer's tech stack. So if you can build automation with AI and bring CRMs and your video and your voice communications and you know all these other bits. If you have a good platform that's able to tie it together, create a create an experience where your users rely on you know the 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 integration of all of these things, and you have a winning platform for sure. Well, and Zoom does have a an app marketplace. Again, taking a little page out of out of Apple on that. Um, they've got a call center product. They've got a phone product. So now you can do your video 
and continued engaging with customers and colleagues on the Zoom telephone side of things and text messages. Uh, they've got an AI companion. So I think they're trying to position themselves in a way that I don't know if they would have even imagined it prior to the pandemic, where they're in all of these spaces competing against a gorilla, in this case, Microsoft, mm. uh, for on the enterprise side. Uh, did you know, Dave, that Zoom has two architectural platforms when it comes to their, to their uh, technology? They have the Zoom cloud that we, as, as businesses and customers use, and they have a Zoom government that uh -huh. is a slightly different animal to conform and comply with some of the government regulations when it comes to security and privacy and the rest. That I didn't know up until recently. But I'd say that because companies that tend to adapt, and Zoom seems like right now they're, they're really shifting, moving into areas that seem like, you know, why, why are they there? Why, you know, why would you get into to a battle with Microsoft and try to get into the enterprise space? I think the race is to see who now who can create the best user experience for workers. Workers that work remote, as well as those in the office, and let those two different parts of the organization communicate seamlessly with each other and its customers. So as it relates to businesses, if you have an ecosystem that can allow this beautiful dance and orchestration of communications, collaboration, um, um, archiving of documents and, and things like that, I think, and you mix in AI to enable that to happen. You said that something earlier, the, the speed, right? The AI allows us to do things that we couldn't do at a speed. I mean, just this episode alone, the information that we've been able to harvest to get ready for this episode in the old days, Dave, would have taken weeks <laughs> Big going through articles, going on the internet, reading them, finding the information, and then disseminating the information among us, coming up with all of that lined up nice and neatly. We were able to do that in under two hours. You know, so if you're watching us and you're wondering how we were able to use the power of AI to extract information from the 80s all the way up to 2020 in less than two hours so we could put this podcast together for you, which is amazing. I, I think oh, it would have taken us weeks, man. Yeah. yeah. Find all well, those news clippings and whatnot. You know, something you said is pretty interesting to me. You were talking about archives and AI. So I'm, I'm imagining, I'm imagining an organization today that's adopting some of these new technologies and then just say in the course of three or four years, they can use their own internal AI to go back and analyze the archives. So it's not mm -hmm. going out into the internet. It's just what's happened internally. Analyze, analyze the past four years of conference calls that were, mm. you know, this particular meeting or whatever it might be. But the AI is going to be, be able to analyze your business's meetings that are archived and then mm -hmm. assist with strategy to be successful in the future or point out obvious failures or missed opportunities. The, fu the future of AI is, you know, we, we've talked about it internally and, uh, and on some of our podcasts where it's AI is not going to replace you. It's not going to take your job. The people that know how to use AI better will be the ones that you really need to fear type of thing. And analyzing archives within a business can lead to interesting strategies uh, for those businesses. Sorry, it was kind of an unthought tangent I just went on, but oh, I'm just thinking, fine. you know, everything that we do internally is archived, right? Yeah, yeah. You know, we use uh, There's we, data everywhere. We're, yeah. we're drowning, I've said this before, we're drowning in data. And what do you do? I have read somewhere that we, most companies only really tap into about 30% of the, all the data they have. Mm -hmm. But imagine having the ability to have something on autopilot that says, you know, last year at this point, you sold X. And you may want this year 
to prepare for this event in this way. And I think the, pre, the, the future of predictive modeling around AI, when it comes to inventory, when it comes to business, when it comes to language, when it comes to combining all these different data sets, and then says, is start giving you suggestions on actions that you can take, I think that's the next leap. When we can get to that point where we can get predictive modeling into the hands of decision makers, and they're able to make decisions that are very good based on the data, they're saying, okay, this could happen in the next two weeks, four weeks, a month, based on these patterns, based on this history, based on all these data sets. I think it gets even more interesting because it can make your business more resilient. You know, Dave, there's so many businesses that fail in the first year. Only one per, only I believe one between one, depending on who, where your sourcing is, one in 5% of businesses make it to 20 years. And there's a lot of things that happen in a business that have to go right to stay in business that long. But if you can feed information that can help you stay in business, cash flow is up. You may want to do this. Cash flow is down. You may want to do that. Uh, too much inventory, do this, not enough inventory, do that. If you, you know, in the healthcare world, there's an AI for a bunch of different things that are, that are looking at diagnosing, um, different diseases that radiologists can't see as well. Yep. Right. So if you have AI working together with the radiologist, you're able to spot things that the naked eye cannot see or can't pick up on a pattern. I think we're definitely going into an age that where the work we knew it, the way for, from the eighties all the way up to the twenties is going to be completely different, completely different from the twenties moving forward with the emergence of platforms, ecosystems, and AI. Very decentralized. You know, when, when we say that things change and nothing stays the same, at least 10 years ago, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, we had, we had a chance to breathe and think about it. And now literally overnight, these technologies are changing the way that people work. Oh, no, no doubt. And in some ways for the better, uh, and, and there, there will be some displacement. I don't think there's any way around it. There'll be some displacement, but just like with every technology that interrupts and changes things, there's displacement. There, the, the horse and buggy guys that cleaned up the poop behind the horses didn't <laughs> love that the cars are coming around and take care of their jobs. Uh, the fact that, um, you know, internet made uh, book depositories a very different thing because now you could put documents in storage electronically. It's a whole different thing, right? I, rem I remember in the late 90s, there used to be boxes and boxes and stuff that went from our offices to storage somewhere just because we had to hold on to documents. <laughs> um, and, you know, you know, what if something happens, you know, six years from now and, you know, some lawsuit happens and da -da -da. well, those were all in storage. Now they're in the cloud, you know, right? Right. so the evolution of change does create disruption and it cuts in both ways. People, people's jobs will be some at stake, but on the other side, there's some, other jobs that didn't exist that will come out of, of this as a result. Like you said, Hey, maybe you got to be the AI expert in knowing how to maximize and leverage this. Um, and who knows, who knows the, the world is very, very different today. And that's kind of what we wanted to drive home today to let you know that, but just like Dave said, things don't stand still. And if you want to be a business that is going to be around for the next 20 years in this new age, Small changes can make a big difference. Nothing stays the same. There's nothing that's the same from last year or even five months ago. And those small changes that you make today, tomorrow, two months from now, those will all help you adapt moving forward. I know that's been one of the keys for our business is to keep making those small changes because the times change. You know, Nortel's not in business anymore. We used to sell a lot to them. IBM has changed who they are. Dell has changed who they are. Apple has changed who they are. Microsoft. And so our business model has, you know, slowly adapted over time because the industry is changing and everybody in every industry is seeing that happen to them right now. So Dave, did we miss anything else? Did you want to jump in and 
say any any other thing um, regarding the uh, what are we calling this part? Yes, the gold standard, the rise of the tech ecosystem. You know, my parting word, my parting words are for business owners specifically that are out there. If you haven't had a chance to look at, you know, some of the platforms that you're using, come talk to us. You're going to get left behind by competitors that are adapting to technologies. We also understand that within the small to medium business, you don't always have access to the best tech specialists. We want to extend our hand and be that trusted advisor for you. So if you want to have conversations about upping your game, technology integration, communication integration, you know, please check us out, global-techtech.com. I wasn't trying to uh, be a commercial at the very end, but I am thinking about just some of the devices that we had spoken about here mm -hmm. and kind of how people started my migrating over to different technologies. They were, they were doing it to save money initially and they may have thought it was too good to be true. But now when you look back at it, it's like, oh, thank God I jumped on that train because if I hadn't, I would have been left behind. So we want to help bring some of these small to medium businesses. We want to help raise you with us, um, help improve your game so that you're around another 20 years and, and longer. Uh, I like that, Dave. Uh, the only thing I would add there is that uh, if we're going to toot our horn a little bit, let's just, let's, let's say this as well for, those businesses that haven't had a tech busters, maybe they have. What happens in tech a lot, whether it's software, hardware, you get this. When the problem happens, no, it's this guy's fault, it's that guy's fault. Do, 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 do. And the accountability isn't there. We, uh, because we offer solutions that are service based, like, uh, like Microsoft Teams and Voice and, and all the rest, as well as the devices that work on those platforms, our interest is working with folks that want everything to work in harmony. And our interest is the customer, not this, which happens a lot because you bought, the, you know, your phones or hardware devices over here. They don't care if, you know, the, your platform is working well or not. It doesn't matter to them. And we invite you to talk to us if you want to explore new solutions or even consolidate old ones, which is happening quite a lot right now as companies are trying to save money. So I want to thank you today for joining us in this adventure, in this road trip, so to speak, from the dawn of the internet to the gold standard, which to play on words for sure. Uh, and so Dave and I invite you to check out that episode. Yeah, I'd mentioned Sandeep of BlackBerry. If you want to hear more about how to survive how to survive how to survive a hostile environment when it comes to technology you want to check out sandeep's conversation that we had with him fascinating um minutes talking to him about this and the technology space so i invite you to go check that out and if you're on youtube check out these videos right here that we've got for you where dave and i will join you and talk about how you can maximize your business potential. I'll see you in those episodes.